Hey Robert Makers, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. And I hope this stream's not too jerky. When I was uh, loading Visual Studio Code then it looks a little bit choppy. So hopefully it's smooth and you're getting a nice smooth sound and audio too. So, do you want to know how to build your own time machine? Or use seven segment displays with bit shifters? Then with the Raspberry Pi Pico, then today's show is for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's see if this works okay. So far, so good. <laughs> so, session goals for today. Uh, when this actually updates the screen, that is a little bit choppy. I don't know what's going on. I think there might have been an update somewhere. I've got nothing else loaded other than Ecamm and Keynote, so who knows what's going on here. <laughs> so the session goals for today. Uh, we're going to add a seven segment display to a Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, and the aim of this, we're going to go through what the aim of this project is, this little side project that I've got going on here. Uh, we're going to look at um, how to 3D print a time circuit uh, model like you can see on screen there. We're going to look at some seven segment displays, what we can use them for in our robot projects, how to wire them up. And then all about bit shifters and these tiny little chips that are called uh, 74HC595s. They've become my friend over the past week. Uh, and we'll look at how to wire up the uh, the time circuit uh, and put some code in it to make it work too. And we'll look at next steps as well. And also happy International Mother's Day as well to all the mothers out there. Uh, and all those people with mothers. <laughs> so the aim of this particular project that um, I've been working on. So let me just... Uh, bring that over yeah something's definitely going on with my machine today apologies for this I don't know why it's being so choppy um, so yes back to the Pico <laughs> so I wanted to, to build my own um, back to the future prop uh, I've had the parts for this for quite some time the little uh, seven segment displays but I've no idea how to use them at the time but I thought I'll buy um, I'll buy some red ones some green ones and some yellow ones because that's the the color that they have on the uh, on the the time machine, the time circuits in the film. Um, and I thought I'll figure it out one day. I know I need to use bit shifters and we'll get on to why I know that. Um, and then I just left them in the drawer for a while. And then I thought, what shall I do this week's video on? Something maybe a bit different. Um, still around the Raspberry Pi Pico and MicroPython code and something loosely to do with robotics too, because we will use it in, in our robots, particularly bit shifters. So this is why I thought this would be a useful exercise just to, to do something fun and um, to learn some other things along the way. So what I did, I uh, used Fusion 360 to knock together uh, quite a quick design, actually. I think this literally took me about 10 minutes to put together as a design. So um, it's quite a simple design. Um, I put the, the in the link in the description on YouTube and on Facebook, there is a link to the Thingiverse files if you wanted to get the STLs and the stickers and everything. That's all there. So I printed that out I, and it's quite a quick print as well. Put the stickers on i'll show you some pictures of it and i'll show you it working as well and um i learned how to use seven segment display so this is what the um you know the the purpose of this little side project is and i learned how to use bit shifters and shift registers for the 12 times eight displays which have seven segments on each <laughs> that would be 192 pins if we weren't to use um, some shift registers that's why they're quite important um, and I've created some code as well, which is trivial um, to get working. The bit that was uh, fiddly to get working was just understanding the sequence of all these things, but we'll we'll get into that. I've done all the hard work, so you don't have to. Okay, so let's go over to Fusion 360 Design. So this is quite a quick one, like I said. Um, so what I did, um, I measured the the, uh, the little modules, and they're about 13 millimeters by 41 millimeters. Um, I then modelled one, just basically a rectangle extruded up um, in Fusion 360, and then I made three of them, I just copied it across, um, and then I, I put them um, into like a, a, a frame, I, I drew a rectangle around them, spaced them out using some constraints, and then um, added some little holes as well, 5mm holes for some LEDs, which I've got just over here one of off there so these little leds um the bit that pokes through and they have got like a little lip to them but the, the the bit that sticks through the hole is five millimeters so everything's friction fit didn't need to glue anything or anything like that i then um put some side pieces on and um just replicated the one rectangular piece uh twice so i had three of them and i just stepped them back uh five millimeters each so it's kind of like a, a stepped look just like on the film and then the side pieces just perfectly fit that just using constraints um 
extruded these sides out and then I also extruded some little plugs that would just keep everything into place and it all holding together there's no glue or anything this is just again friction fit so you can see on the screen there if you wanted to grab the uh, the STL files it's on Thingiverse thing 4851824 so very simple to to print and put together it doesn't need any um, support material or anything like that and I printed this particular model um, in the most rough um, low quality mode and it's fine it looks great it's supposed to look like a battered aluminium anyway isn't it so here's some uh, <laughs> very exciting uh, graphics there one of it printing my 3d printer and then you can see the finished look there as well so um, yeah I usually print these I did actually change the print uh, on that one yeah you can see that it's got um, does it call that a skirt where it kind of goes outside three times and then does the inside bit and I did get a little bit of uh, warping off the bed where it sort of like lifts away a little bit so I then reprinted them with a with a, a brim I actually used the, the one that had the the warp because it looks fine you can't really tell uh, but I did print the next ones with a brim so a brim's probably better it just keeps it sort of stuck down and I did adjust my um, bed leveling because it wasn't quite enough that's why I was getting the um the warping um, because it wasn't um there's on on the um i use marlin as the uh, firmware for my 3d printer and there are some options in marlin to be able to um to dial up um they call it baby steps and you can dial it up and it'll very fractionally high, higher or lower um the extruder to the bed and the bed that i've got is pretty level i've got one of the level sensors so i know where all the hot spots are um, but sometimes it isn't still quite enough to sort of make it adhere to the bed so i usually just dial it back about 100 150 um, millimeters something like that <laughs> so adam says typo alert slided should be sliced absolutely slided with cura sliced i just threw this one together you know no effort on this, this particular show I spent so long on the uh, on the on the other bits that I'll tell you about later. Thanks for that, Adam. Yes, uh, and uh, and hello as well. And hi, Brian. And hi, Carlos too. So seven segment displays. Let's have a look at these, shall we? These are everywhere. So I've got one here as well, just on a little breadboard. Um, the they're all kinds of sizes. You get them in all kinds of uh, packages as well. So here's one from. Uh, Monk makes from a Simon Monk, uh, and that's um, eight. Uh, sorry, that's four. <laughs> I'm looking at the number eight and saying eight. That's a four-digit um, display, and you can see there that the uh, it's essentially just a single digit replicated four times. There isn't the uh, the time indicator between them like there is on the one I've been using. So what are these these uh, these segment displays? They're just LEDs. It's just they, they call them seven segment, but they usually have a decimal point. So there's actually eight LEDs in a typical package. And um, yeah, I came across this uh, panic thing because um, LEDs um, have anodes and cathodes, and that's the direction of the current. If you put uh, an LED the wrong way around, it just won't work. I don't think they blow out, but they, they, they just don't work. The reason they don't blow out is because they're a diode, light emitting diode. And diodes mean that the electricity only flows in one direction from the from the anode to the cathode. Uh, and panic is the thing to remember that. So positive is anode, negative is cathode. And I always say the long and the short of it, the long leg is the anode and the short leg is the cathode. So yes, seven segments make up the character. Absolutely. So let's have a look at that, shall we? Seven segment display. So yes, sometimes, um, the, not, not sometimes, seven segment displays have seven segments to them. You can see them uh, lettered there. So we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H for the decimal point. Uh, and they work by just lighting up different segments. So it is just like you've got seven LEDs all in particular arrangement. And I've seen people 3D print huge LED things and they just create essentially a box, put a regular LED or some kind of light in it, and they just light them and it lights up that particular channel of the box just like this. And you, you find them everywhere. So I'm looking at my bench power supply. I don't know if you can actually see that if I go to the overhead. If my button actually works, come on. Yeah, something is definitely going on with the, that today. Let me just find the overhead. Um, so that one there. So this bench supply I've got here, that has a seven segment display on it. Um, it's got a few of them. So it's got six in total and a couple of LEDs as well. But they're nice and bright. You can see them from everywhere. <laughs> so Brian, uh, sorry, Adam says, uh, 
they are tiny. The, the biggest one is now one meter high. That's pretty impressive. A meter high. <laughs> so they're everywhere. They used to be on like um, video recorders, VHS recorders back in the day. And you'll find them on uh, microwave ovens, typically have them um, electric ovens as well I think have them they're really cheap and very very bright very easy to get working and they, they work very functionally as a display so you will find them everywhere um, and like I said very simple to get working it's just we just need to know what the sequence of these particular um, these particular segments are and then we can create any kind of letter or number from it you can get some more complicated ones that have got diagonals um, and straight pieces in the middle so you can do like letter Y's and W's and M's and everything which are quite tricky on this kind of display uh, but people tend to get around that uh, in other ways. So let me just come back to my presentation there. Um, so that was a single digit. Um, you can get them with multiple digits as well. So this is the variety that I have in my... Um, let me just grab hold of it for a second. Um, so this is the one that I have. If I just go full screen for a second, I can show you this. It really is not wanting to do respond to that, is it? So let's just go to that. So this is the one that I've got. Yes, my first watch was also uh, like an LED, but it was um, the, the LCD versions of the seven segment displays rather than the light emitting diodes. But uh, I do know that some of them were, the original ones were like that, the uh, Timex and the, the Sinclair one. So you can see these have got this extra double dot in the middle, and they've also got this extra point up here as well, which I think is for like, um, uh, like degrees, degree C, something like that. So you can see there, I've got 12 of these. I've got three rows of three, and each one has got four in the package, and there is seven segments in each. And I've also got a couple of extra LEDs there as well. So I'm just gonna put that back down there. Okay. So we just, so the unusual thing about the ones in the package, so unlike a singular one, that's pretty straightforward. You've just got a couple of pins around the edge. Um, so the way that these work, if I just hold this one up to you here, um, you may or may not be able to see this. There's just a couple of pins around there. The two middle pins are voltage pins and the rest um, are just the A, B, C, D, E, F, G uh, pins and the, the decimal point as well. I think this, this does have a decimal point on it as well. Um, so that's what the, uh, what's that, eight? That's for yeah, eight pins are four, seven segments, and the uh, the LE the uh, decimal point. So Tom says, uh, just want to say hi. Uh, my turn to bring the kids to bed. <laughs> well, you can catch up on the replay. That's the great thing with uh, with YouTube, isn't it? Great stuff. So what I was saying about these uh, four segment displays is that unusually they don't have a pin for every single segment on these. They have a pin, one pin for the seven segments, the decimal point. The, the timepiece is one and two, and the, the little point at the top there, the L3. Um, but the common across all of the four characters. So what you have then is just another four pins for, for digit one, digit two, digit three, and digit four. So what you do is you, you light up digit one, you just send a, a high to digit one, and then you set the character, you know, the segments that you want to display on there. And then you then quickly enable um, digit two, do the same thing for the characters you want lit up there, then digit three, and the persistence of vision will make it look to your eye like they're all lit all the time, but it's really just a trick. And it's a save down on the number of pins. On the back of the, the um, uh, of this, if I can show you that as well, you might be able to see that there is a hell of a lot of pins on each of these. So there's actually, if I just hold it like that, you can see that middle one there. Um, it's got, um, I'm going to say eight pins, 16 pins in total. So that's a lot of pins. So that's why it's 192 pins if I want to wire this up. So that's never going to work with something like a Pico or a Raspberry Pi or even the uh, the Arduino Mega, which I've got one somewhere in my little bits. So if I just go to the overhead again. Yeah, it's really not having a good day, is it? That uh, I'll not mention this again, but I'm having a bit of a techie issue here. So let me just go to the overhead scene. There we go. So if this is a regular um, Arduino here, and then next to it we have a Mega, we do get quite a few extra pins on there. There they are just sort of side by side. So you can see you get these extra blocks of headers pins there as well. So 
that's fine if you've you've got a couple of extra. So when I was building my InMove robot, um, they used uh, two um, AT Megas um, because you've got them extra pins to plug everything into. So each each servo signal pin would go to one of these. Uh, they didn't use any kind of shift pins or any kind of uh, PCA9685 board to do any kind of thing like that. It was all just extra pins on there. And I thought that was a little bit lazy because these things are not, they're not expensive, but they're not cheap at the same time. They're not, if you buy the official one, they can be quite expensive. Um, so this is why the, the seven segment display in the package um, is better than just having several singular ones. You would have to have them all have a, either a common anode or a common cathode. Uh, and that's what they'll call these depending which way round the voltage goes through them. So um, I don't know if I've got the, printed out the, uh, the, the, the documentation. Let's have it. Yes, so this is the documentation that I printed out for mine. And these are Young Sung LED Technologies. <laughs> and it's got all the information on there and a bit of a circuit diagram as well. Um, we'll get to a nicer version of that that I've drawn for you. Okay. Oop, did I skip forward to then? So this is the um, the the package itself. So if we look at this little box just on the, um, the right hand side of the screen there, uh, that's not a chip, that's actually just the, the 16 pins that are sticking out the back of this uh, package. Um, and what you can see just next to it there uh, on the left is uh, all the different segments. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, the decimal point, L1 and L2, which is these time indicators in the middle. Uh, and then we have L3, which is that uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit temperature full stop at the top there and then we have the the digit selector so we have digit one two three and four uh, and then this is where they are arranged around the, those pinouts so d1 d2 is on pin one and pin two then we have the, the character letter d so which is the bottom piece on the uh, the display then we have the l1 anode um, then we have character e and so on so yes, 16 pin dip, as Adam says, dual inline package. You can get the most common one, I think is 12 and it doesn't have the time indicators in the middle or the little temperature dot at the top. And it's essentially just four singular um, seven segment displays with a, with a uh, decimal point. So yes, the, the segments are common to all. You activate a particular digit by pulling that um, pin either high or low. And it again depends on if the package is common anode or common cathode. And you'll find that when you when you're ordering it. So bit shifting. This is the thing that I found really useful on really what this particular show really is about, I guess. So bit shifting is something that we can use to use with shift registers. These little little chips. Um, sometimes they just get referred to as five nine fives or seventy four HC five nine five to give it its full name. They are very very cheap, very easy to use. They are about five volts power wise. I did get mine to work with three point three volts, so that's great. Um, but LEDs take a lot of power in general. You know, you're talking like half an amp or something like that for it to. Sorry, half a milliamp, five hundred milliamps, whatever that ends up being. They can draw a lot of current, is what I'm saying. <laughs> for what they are, they do get quite warm as well. Um, so yes, bit shifting. This is how we're going to actually get around having to wire up 192 pins into um, some kind of device. We can just wire them to these things and shift bits. So when we shift bits, what we're actually doing is just moving some binary bits that are on or off to either the left or the right. We're going to move these to the right. And what that's going to do is allow us to feed in one bit at a time into this bit shift register, a sequence of ones and zeros and those ones and zeros are going to correspond to those seven segments so we're going to feed it in like the letter um, sorry the number five for example and that might be turn on the top one which is a turn on so let's have I think five b would be off c would be on d would be on five would be um, and then e would be off f would be on and g would be on and you can have your decimal point on if you want or not. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to send that sequence of ones and zeros into the bit shift register. And we're going to do it one bit at a time using a bit shift operator. So in Python, that's the double uh, chevrons, the double um, arrows. Yep, is that what you call them? Chevrons, arrows. It's the double 
ones of those, like a carrot on its side. Uh, and we can shift more than one bit at a time if we want to, but that doesn't help us in this particular um, usage. We just want to shift one bit at a time. You can see on that little diagram there what happens. We start with 101 with five zeros after it. We shift it to the right and one of those zeros just drops off the end, just disappears. Uh, and we get a new zero appearing in front of it. But then the one zero, one, and then four zeros stay there. And then if we shift it again, we can see what happens. It drops one off the end, a new zero appears at the other end. And we'll do that. If we do that eight times for eight bits, we'll end up with an empty register. So that's what we're going to actually use in our little piece of code to set up the, uh, the segments to display. So shift registers, let's have a look at one of these. So this is the 74 HC595. Like I said, my little friend, I've, I originally bought um, only a couple of these. I think there was about five on a little package there. So I ordered another another job lot of these. So there's 25 in this uh, little package here. So you can see there, dip 16, 25 pieces, three state, and they are nice little things. These ones just come as the regular chips. This one came with the little holders in as well in there. So you can just see uh, if I hold that up there, I put one of them into its little holder package. Uh, and that just means if you if you sort of soldering this, you can actually solder the, the holder without having to put any heat onto the chip because sometimes these things can be a bit sensitive. So let's have a look at the chip itself. So on the left hand side there, well, first of all, before we get into that, when you look at one of these chips, you'll find that there is um, there's a sort of notch on one of the ends. If I just hold this up to this screen so you can see this, um, if I can get that into focus. Now you might see, um, so towards the right of the screen there, there's a tiny little notch. Can you see there? There's like a little horseshoe shaped notch there. I can just see it catching the light now. So that means that that is the orientation where one is the bottom. So if I hold it in that orientation, uh, one is now just here. That's the first pin. And the way that the pins go is usually like one, two, three, four, five, and then they, they, they go round and then they go up and then back across, um, just like you can see on the screen there. So I've oriented that sort of top down. So pins one to eight are on the left hand side and then it goes nine to 16 back up the other side. So pins one to seven are our inputs. Um, so I've actually been a bit lazy in my numbering there. Um, for some reason, they decided to put data pin input zero, the first one. I've, I've labeled it as input eight here, but correctly labeled it as A. <laughs> um, so that's the first input. And then the, the second input, third input, fourth input go down the other side there. So B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So that's eight bits. So that's the output of the chip. So we can plug that into whatever we like and whatever we feed in using the serial input one bit at a time will eventually display on those eight outputs when we flip when we flip the latch. So I'll talk through that in a second, but let's just have a look through what these different pins are. We've got a ground there on pin eight. Uh, we've got on pin 16 some voltage in and it works fine with 3.3 volts or 5 volts. Uh, we've got the, the pin 0 um, for the data there. And then we've got this serial input. So what the serial input will do is if we flip that high or low, we will register a 0 or a 1, 1 or a 0. Um, and we then need to to tick the clock internally in this for it to say, right, I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna stick it onto my register. And I'll grab a piece of paper in a minute and just sort of show you how this works, um, just sort of diagrammatically. Um, then there is, um, and I'll go through that sequence in a minute, the output enable pin next. Um, we have to connect that to ground, which just means make this chip active because uh, we might have a sequence of these and for some reason we might want to deactivate this particular chip in the sequence and um, making that go high or um, not connected to ground will make this inactive. So output enable, connect that to ground. Then we have the register clock latch. I always think this is like a latch on a door because once you open that latch, anything that's in the internal register will then be displayed on the output pins. So whatever we've fed in one bit at a time into this chip will eventually be displayed on those output pins. And what I mean by displayed is if we fed in 1010101010 in that kind of sequence, then pin 15 would be a one, pin one would be a zero, pin two would be a one, pin three would be zero and so on. So that's whatever we put into the register, we fed in one bit at a time, we'll display on those pins. Once we've um, 
we've flipped the latch. So um, the latch we have to flip by just sending it a high low signal and it's one of these sort of rising edge. As soon as it detects that change it will then put everything live into the, uh, the output pins. So then next we've got the clock register. So that's where we just tick the, um, the clock. Um, so when we, um, yeah, somebody just said there, the, the pins are actually output pins. I've, I've been lazy in how I've done this. These should actually be um, input pins. Why is that just flipped across to there? That's very unusual. Uh, let me just back up there. I think my ecam is not behaving properly. I'm gonna register a fault with them, I think, after this. Uh, let me just back up there. Um, let me just go back over to, I think maybe it just caught up when I pressed the uh, the button to just flip to the host. Yeah, so what somebody was saying there, what Michael was saying there is I've, I've labeled these as data inputs. These are data outputs. Sorry, this, uh, I was in a bit of a rush uh, after I'd got the thing working to try and just document everything like that. So <laughs> normal, just, just pretend these are data outputs. So the, the clock, uh, similar to the latch, but the clock, um, every time we want to put a new value into the serial input, we just need to make the clock go high and low. And again, it's a rising edge change. It will detect that sort of flip of the signal um, and then it will accept whatever is, is on the serial input pin. So we can go, we can make the serial bit input high if we want to register a one, for example. Um, we um, tick the clock, we make the clock pin go high and then low. It will register that one, put it into its uh, internal register. Then we will, um, if we wanted the, the next pin to be like low, so we say serial input, we then make that a low pin, a low value, a zero. We then flip the um, the clock again to send it high, low signal. It'll then go, all oh, right, serial's got a zero on it. It'll then move everything along in its register, it'll shift it along, and it'll put that one behind it, and it'll keep doing that every time we, we tick the clock. It'll just see whatever's on the input pin, um, and the, the tick of the clock will just move things along. Now, when something gets to the sort of eighth register, if you tick the clock again, it will just fall off the end of the earth. It'll just drop out and whatever is on the serial pin will just be then introduced at the very beginning. And then the next pin there, we've got pin 10. That's the shift register um, clear function. So if we just want to, we want to very quickly just clear the register of everything that's in its internal memory, we simply just um, um, connect that. Um, well, it says there connect to VCC. If you connect that to an extra pin, which is what I did, you can then activate that as a clear function. If you connect it to VCC, it, it'll just stay um, deactivated as a clear function. You won't be able to clear the, the register unless you just send eight zeros to it or eight ones, whatever you want. And then the very the last pin, pin nine that we've got on there, which is the daisy chain, that's a way of having more than one of these these chips in sequence. So if you want to have a 16-bit word or a 32-bit word, you can have you know two of these chips or four of these chips all daisy chained together. Uh, so that that pin nine there is um, where you would send this. You put that to the serial of the next um, uh, chip. So pin nine will go to pin 14 on the next chip, and um, what that will do is it will just push instead of that bit falling off the end of the earth, it will go into the serial input of the next. Um, um, the next chip. <laughs> you you will have to uh, wire up the other pieces as well, like the ground. They would have to share a common ground. They would have to share the voltage in. Now, what I did with the voltage in, um, I'm using my desk power supply. I'm not powering this through the Pico. So the Pico connects to the um, the serial input and to the clock, the register, and the clear. Um, but that's all it connects to. Um, because it wouldn't be able to drive the LEDs. It would just burn out within seconds and damage yet another Pico chip. So how do these shift registers work? One bit at a time. <laughs> so this is the sequence that we'll go through. So to clear the register, we can just um, make that clear. The SRCLR pin, pin 10, we can just drop that low temporarily and then put it back high again because uh, high would be the, the voltage in and that will just clear it, make it all, all zeros. Then the first thing we can do, so if we want to just set a couple of bits in there, we will say set bit of our input thing. So pin 14, we would set that to whatever the bit is going to be, zero or one. We then tick the clock on the uh, SRCLK, the serial clock pin. So we go low and then high. Um, the next is to set the serial bit again to whatever we want that to be. Tick the clock, low or high, low and then high. And we continue that process until we put eight bits into this register. Then we toggle the latch. We flip the latch, 
high and low, and then that becomes live on the output pins, on all those sort of purple pins there in the sequence. So the, um, let me just get this right. The, the which one is, is it the least significant and most significant bit? We'll draw this out and we can we can have a look at this on the overhead. Let me just grab a sheet of paper. Again, just so we can understand what's going on there. Right, so I've definitely pressed that button there. Let's go to the overhead. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to move this up slightly. Let's move that like so. You can see me there. All right, let me just tighten these um, up. Like so. Okay, so what I was just going to draw out there. So if we've got, um, okay, let's just rip a piece of paper off here. So if we've got um, a sequence of ones and zeros on here, so let's just draw out, um, let's just draw out eight bits. And the sequence that these are going to be in is, is like so. So going from right to left, that's going to be our first pin that we put in, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. So if we've got our register, we've got our chip here, We've got our, our serial pin there. What's going to happen is we're going to take this very first character here, this first bit, bit sorry, uh, and that's going to get fed in to this serial. So it's going to come in over here and inside its internal register. Um, and let's just draw this out as a little table. So it's going to put in there um, a zero. So that's going to be the first thing. We then flip the clock to say move along. And we're also at the same time, because we're controlling when the, the clock flips, we're now going to look at the second pin, so the second digit in our bit, so bit number two, uh, and that's going to be a one. So what when we flip the clock, what it will do is it will actually move that along, and that's going to go into the second register inside our, um, in our, in our register. And then it's going to take that one and put that next. So you can see what's going to happen there next. It's going to be a zero. We flip the tick the clock again it's going to move these all along so then we've got the zero coming in uh, like so so it's going to take this and it's going to build out the um, the outputs and um, that's going to look like it's in reverse angle that's just the way I've drawn it it will actually just appear um, so that when when it's finished doing this it will look correct from the output point of view so output one will be the the first output that we put in there and so on so it doesn't reverse the order, it will, it will be the correct orientation. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the next bit. So how do we send this um, eight bits of data to the shift register to display a number on our seven segment display? So you can see there that all the seven segments the display, we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can also draw extra characters. I've added some extra ones there, A, B, C, D, E, F. You can't draw every letter of the alphabet, unfortunately, because characters like M, that have got an up, uh, sorry, three legs to it, or like a W with uh, three uprights to it, that's not going to work on this type of display. Um, but, uh, or like the letter K. Um, uh, there's probably a few others as well that are quite difficult to draw. I've seen some alphabets that people have put together on the internet, so you can get away with quite a few things, but just not everything. Uh, but certainly all the numbers work fine, that's what it was designed for. So if we look at just a couple of these, just so we understand what's going on. So if we look at the uh, the number zero, that's actually made up of six um, segments. So segment A is lit up, segment B is lit up, and they can see that segment C is lit up, D, E and F, and segment G isn't. So everything apart from G is let up. So for character, and then we've got the decimal point. I've just left that zero for everything. Then for one, we've only got B and C lit up. So again, if we look at our little table here, we've got B and C lit up, uh, but that's all. Number two, we've got A, B, D, E, and G. A, B, D, E, and G. So there we go. And that's every combination of binary. So each one of those um, is the, the eight bits the byte that represents that character. So as long as we just send that to our shift register, um, it will be able to display that as long as we have um, these 
connected to the, the output pins in the correct way. So I've got the output pin one connected to A, output pin two connected to B and so on. So that whatever we feed in in this particular table will display correctly on our output. So wiring this up to the Pico. So I've said do not power this from the do not power the LEDs on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Use an external power supply. I've got my bench power supply there um, connected to the on the the 595 chip to that voltage in pin 16. That's a separate from the Pico. All that we are feeding from the Pico is the serial input, um, the clock the latch and I've added the clear. You don't actually need that, but I've just added it just to make it uh, easy for me to, to troubleshoot. Uh, Cause if you get halfway through and you fed something into the register, you don't know what's in there and you don't know how many pins in it is. So you'd have to send eight digits just to wipe it. Um, but if they're not working or you, you're trying to troubleshoot that, that's why it's useful just to have a clear just to start again. So what I've done there is um, I've, I've used pins zero, one, two, and three excuse me, pin zero, one, two, and three. Zero is our data pin, one is our clock pin. Then we have the latch pin on pin two and clear attached to pin three. And these are just of type pin output in MicroPython. We're not using any kind of SPI, although I have seen that work. Um, I have seen other people use other libraries and so on, but it's very simple to get this working. And this is what I quite like about it. And I, I haven't actually found anybody using shift registers with a really good explanation on YouTube. So um, maybe this is the first video <laughs> that tries to explain this well for Raspberry Pi Picos. Um, so Andy's asking um, a question there. Do you need common ground to the Pico? Nope, you don't need that. It works fine because it's working at logic level. Um, it's, it doesn't need to have a common ground to the Pico. You can get weird things happening with um, electronics where ground is like a negative voltage. Um, and then if you plug that in, like they say it was like negative 24 volts and you plug that into your Pico, you can actually fry it. So, um, I mean, that shouldn't happen, but it could happen. So it works fine. It's just taking it as logic level. Um, these components are often called T TTL um, components because they work at five volts. Uh, these ones are nice and friendly because they do work at 3.3 volts um, as well. So that's what I've got my bench power supply set at. Um, and because we're only sending signals to the from the Pico to this device, we're not reading anything back. Um, we're not at any danger of it sending back five volts to a pin and blowing it up. So nice and simple to get working. So demo time, right? Bear with me while um, Visual Studio Code grinds to a halt. So I'm just going to load it up. I'm just going to change the main camera for a second while I do that. And I will also have a look and see if you've got any questions or anything as we go. So, and I'll just show you while that loads up. Um, Look at that camera there. And I'm just gonna plug in this for a second. So I have cheated. When I was experimenting with this, um, and it looks like it's flickering there. When I look at that, that looks like a solid light. It's just counting up eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I used a, an Arduino. <laughs> And look how many pins that I've got connected to that. I've got all the pins connected. I'm not using a shift register on this. I've just connected it up just to see, could I get this thing working? What color were they? That kind of thing. Um, so that was just me doing a bit of experimentation with an Arduino. Good old Arduino. Right. You can see Visual Studio is just loading up now. There's definitely something that's happened on my computer recently. Uh, I installed the new uh, Mac update. I don't know if that's introduced something slowness. I can see my speech isn't synchronized when I'm looking at the uh, confidence monitor there. Right, we've nearly got the code loaded. Um, it's just doing its loading thing and then we can have a look and see. There we go, it's just loading up now. So, have you done anything special for Mother's Day <laughs> for your mothers? <laughs> have you done anything? I suppose it depends where you are and what time it is. So in the UK, it's at seven o'clock in the evening now. And uh, we had our Mother's Day back in March. Was it 20, let's say, what would it have been? 29th of March, something like that. I don't know why we have it earlier than everyone else, but we, we, we did. Right, okay, I'm gonna bring this down here and I'm gonna make that the same size as that display there. Um, let me see. V 
Visual Studio is really, really going slow. Yeah, I think there might be a broken update. Adam's saying, is it another broken update? I wonder what the new OS X will bring. Absolutely. And I don't know who to blame on this one. Is it is it Apple or is it Ecamm? Because they did an update uh, last week. Um, don't know. Because I've got plenty of... Uh, CPU available, it just looks like it's running really slowly, but Visual Studio is just like grinding to a halt. Something is stealing lots of resources. And I always reboot my machine before the show, just for you, <laughs> just to make sure everything runs really smoothly. And I have literally nothing else running in the background. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then, um, I am, yeah, Apple keeps pushing out broken updates. I guess they've they've spread themselves really thin now, haven't they, Apple? Because they've got, they've got Apple Watches, they've got Apple TVs, they've got iPads, they've got, um, iPhones and then they have the um, the regular Mac OS so when they make a change on one thing they've got to make it across everything otherwise everything gets out of sync so you know if they make a change to Keynote um, they've then got to update the iOS app update um, they're, run, they're now running across how many different platforms so they've got the original ARM chip on the iPad they've now got the M1 chip they've got the Intel chip on the Mac and the, the M1 chip on the Mac as well so they've got all these different chips to uh, to code for so yeah that's the, the strategy that they've chosen anyway right okay I think we can get this to work now so let me see if I can flick over to um, screen share let's see if that's the one Okay, so, so just bear with me. I might look a bit choppy there, but um, let me know if the audio is okay. So I've written a few different bits of code here. Um, I'm just going to look through and find the one. I think simple is the one, which is the one I want to show you first, um, because this is the simplest one. Um, okay. Right, so what I've done there is um, I've input, um, ignore the SPI, I don't actually use that at all. The, from machine, I've imported pin, I've imported time, um, sleep, in fact, from, um, yeah, has decided to do that now. Uh, it's imported the sleep as well. We're going to use that to do our delays. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on there just so that you get a bit more, uh, you can see a little bit more what's going on on the code. And I've got my Raspberry Pi connected. Uh, and what I want it to do in a second is run some um, a simple piece of code that will um, um, be a binary counter. So we'll be able to just count up the bits and that will show you that that's actually working on that. And that, um, yeah, so I think that's not the one I'm after. I'm just going to go for segment. That looks like the one I've most recently been editing. Yeah, that looks like the one. Okay. So, yeah, um, I don't use the SPI, we can ignore that. So I've imported time and sleep. And then I've got a couple of um, badly named uh, variables. I was doing this for speed because I was typing this out so many times. So DP is our um, our, our, our uh, data pin. Then we have our clock pin, we have our latch pin, and we have our clear pin. So pin 0, 1, 2, and 3. And uh, they're all pin outputs. And on the clear one, I've just made that a pull-up one. Um, I was experimenting with this internal pull-up and uh, pull down resistors inside the Pico. Uh, and I think I found that that worked fine for pulling that up because we want the the um, the voltage to be um, three volts on that pin. Uh, and when we pull it, when we, we send a zero, we want that to clear the, uh, clear the register. So um, I found that that did seem to work okay there. And then I just set the all the values to zero to begin with. So I say value is zero, value is zero for the data pin, the clock pin and the latch pin. Then what I've done, I laboriously typed out every one of the characters from that table that we looked at in the presentation. So um, for zero, um, now this is what's weird about um, about how these things work. Because they're sharing the cathode, I've got the ones with the common cathode, you put a one in the top to say activate um, digit number one. And we've got four digits, digit number one. And then on the other side, we actually want to turn off the um, segments, not turn them on, which is weird. So you actually flip it the other way around. You send zeros rather than ones. And that creates like a ground for the, the electricity to go through uh, the other side. If you have that as a one, um, it blocks the electricity from, from passing through. So you have to just flip them. Um, so next I have a little clear function and the clear function simply sends a low then a high. So it's, remember it's a rising edge. So we send a low and then a high that makes it from a zero to a one. I assume the high is a one. 
um, and, the, and I actually do run that little clear function after I've defined it. The tick function, which makes the clock tick. And, and this is one of the unusual things about the clock ticking. Unlike something like I squared C or SPI, where the clock is actually coming from the chip and it's coming at a regular frequency. On these ones, we can tick the clock whenever we like. There can be absolutely no pattern between um, clocks. It doesn't have to be, you know, on the second or on the 20 milliseconds or anything like that. We can do it whenever we like. So I found that interesting. Um, so to tick the clock, we just go low and then high, and it's the rising edge that makes it uh, detect there. And if it was already high, setting it low means that we can, it can then detect the high when it changes. The latch is the same. We go from a high to a low on that one. And then to write the values to the register, this is where the bit of logic and the bit of Python uh, comes in. So it might look a bit weird and I'll talk you through what's going on here. So we've got a loop. So we say from I in range of eight, because we've got eight bits that we want to go through uh, and we're going to use I as our little counting variable there. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the ith um, um, bit from our, our, our array of bits, wherever I put that piece of paper then. So if I've got this um, this array of, um, of bits on here, uh, I want to take the very first one. So when the loop goes around once, it's going to look at bit number one. And when it goes around the next time, it's going to look at bit number two and so on. So that's what's going on in, in this loop. So I is going to represent whichever bits we're looking at. Um, and we say data, which is just our temporary variable to figure out what bit is it a zero or is it a one, equals the value which we pass in there, because we might pass in... Um, we pass in a sequence of bits, it's going to read that in as an integer, as an unsigned 8-bit integer. Um, so that's what gets passed in as value. And then we do the bit shifting operation by i. So when it comes in, we're going to look at, um, we're going to shift um, one bit and i, and then we and to that. And anding, um, again, I might need to just very quickly show you that if you've not done um, binary arithmetic before, this might be a bit of a mystery. We're going to and to it the number one. And what that essentially does is it takes away everything apart from that very first value. So let me just go back to the overhead. I can just find that there. So if we have, um, just do over here. So if we have several numbers in binary, let's just do uh, 32, 64, uh, we just need one more, 128. So these are all the different positions that we have in binary, in our 8 bits. And we can also number the bits just so that we understand what's going on there. So if we want to and together two values, it's a truth table. It's um, so let's just put in um, let's just put in this pattern of one zero one zero one zero one zero, and we're going to add to that the number one. So what we do is we say um, if both of these values are one, then that's going to be uh, an output of one. So one plus zero is nothing. We we get the result nothing. We're on a truth table. Zero plus one is nothing. 0 plus 0 is nothing, zero, and so on, and so on, and so on. So when we and 1, we get the output of 0, because that's actually what's in that position there. So anding 1 with whatever we put in there will, will tell us that first character. Uh, and the way that these things work in a truth table, I don't know if you've ever seen a truth table. So if we just have, um, let's have a, a value in here. So um, we're going to put in... Um, let me have a think. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna um, it's not that sorry. It's just it's just output. Um, if we put in a one, and we're going to add to that um, uh, another character y. Let's just do this. In fact, let's just. In fact, let's just start again. <laughs> Get a new sheet of paper. So a truth table, so we do x, and we have y, and we have the output. Right, so we're just going to draw, like so, the different values that we have. So for an anding function, it's going to return an output if both values are 1. So it's only going to work when both outputs are 1, when x and y that are coming in are 1. Um, that's for an and function. Uh, we have things like not, 
a knot is very simple. Um, so whatever we put in, we have a one or a zero, it flips it round. So a knot is the opposite. We have nans, which is basically just adding an extra thing to this where it flips it over like that. So we get the opposite of what's gone in. We have an XOR, which will be exclusively um, OR. But before we understand that, we need to know what OR is. So let's just uh, see if we can squeeze an OR one in here. So we're going to get X, Y, and then output. So if either of them is a one, then you'll get a value for one in an, in an OR output. So if either input is a one, so you get one, 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 zero, and XOR is uh, exclusive OR. So it essentially is the same, but apart from that one there. So you just get it only if they are, if one is, if they are opposites, if, if it's a zero, one or one and a zero, but not both, that's what an exclusive OR is. So we'll, we'll do another one on uh, binary, at another point if that's useful to you. Uh, but I thought it's just quickly we had to go through that because that's how an anding operation works in MicroPython. So let's go back to, that's working okay there now. So what the AND function is doing, it's taking our eight bits, um, which we're getting from the value. Um, we're then finding the the ith bit of that. So when we go around the first loop, that's gonna be a one. And then we're anding to that one because we just want to know what the very first value of that bit is. Um, and we will find that by doing the shifting operation. Because remember, when we shift it, it's shifting everything. It's not just shifting that first character, it's shifting the whole thing. And we're only ever interested in the first um, digit, the first bit. So that will then give us what we're after. Um, we then print that out just to just a troubleshoot, just to sort of show what's going on there. And if the data is a zero, we then say, go high, make our data pin high. Uh, else make it go low. And remember, this is because we have a common cathode and we want ones to be low and zeros to be high, which is kind of the reverse that you'd expect. And it's because we're, we're using a common cathode LED displace the device. And then um, we tick the clock, which again, just does that low and high. After we've done that, that loop function and we've been around that eight times, we then flip the latch, which just goes low and then high. And then we can print the value out just to see what's going on. And then I've just got a sleep there. So then further down, I've got a counter and that just says from X in the range, two, five, six. And why two, five, six? That's again back to our, um, how many bits can you store? What's my bit of paper now? How many bits can you store in a uh, eight bits? And it's 255. So when we looked at this uh, little, um, that's working fine now. It seems to have caught up with itself. If you add up 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128, you'll get 255. And that's because that's the maximum number of values that you can store in one of those bits. And in fact, the next one along is 256. If you were to carry that sequence on, it keeps doubling every time. Um, so that's what we can store. We can store 255 values plus the zero. So there's essentially 256 different values, zero being one of them. So that's what we do there. We just want to go through all the different sequences. Um, we want to um, make data, sorry, we want to go through all the 256 values. We have 56 because we're counting from one as the first number there. Um, and the way that these four function works, you always have to have one more value than you actually need because it will stop after it's reached um, um, the, the, the very bottom, it won't go round again uh, when it reaches the, the next number in the sequence. Then 4i in the range of 8, because we're 8 bits, we want to just do that bit shifting operation. So data equals x, bit shifted by i, anded to the 1 to get just the bit that we're interested in. Just like we did before, if the data is 0, make the data pin low, otherwise go high, tick the clock. After we've gone through that eight times, make the latch um, flip, print out X and then just sleep. So what that will do, let me get my overhead shot and the Pico and everything in range. Let's go back to the overhead. Well, let's try actually this view here. So it's these LEDs here that we're gonna be looking at and I'm gonna run the code and hopefully um, right, let's, sorry, did I press stop then? Run again. Right, so, 
Um, what did I do that? Clear. All right, so I'm actually not running that counter program. So let's just make sure that's in there. Let me just clear them and then let's just run counter. Let's put that on a nice new line. Okay, oh, come on. <laughs> right, let's try that. Okay, so you can see now on the screen, we've got a binary counter going on. So you can see it's ticking up, it's going through all the different values. Is that one just in place there? There we go. So it's not very exciting to look at, but this was a major breakthrough when I got this to actually work. Uh, so this is proving that we're the the shift register is working the way we expect it to work. So what we're doing, remember, we're going through a loop 256 times. Um, each time we're just going to pass um, a value. We're going to we're going to add that to one to get that one bit. We're going to shift that into the register, um, the whole eight bits, one bit at a time. We're going to flip the latch and then it's going to display whatever that is on our eight output pins. And these eight output pins are just connected um, to the little chip there. It's a whole um, rat's nest, is that the right word, of wiring um, that's going on there. Um, so we've got the wires, the four wires coming from the Raspberry Pi Pico to the chip. There's the voltage that's coming from my desk power supply just by these little crocodile clips here. So that's just the 3.3 um, volts there. And I can see there it's uh, 0 0.06 amps. So what's that? So quite low power because we're only using a couple of LEDs. There's no current um, limiters on them as well. I'm a bit naughty there risking it but 3.3 volts is is very little when it comes to leds that's fine that's not going to be an issue i've actually got another set of leds just here as well these red ones that they, they should be doing the opposite value of um, of these ones uh, and we'll see in a second when it gets to 255 they'll just it'll just stop there stop counting and stop running the program uh, but this does prove that our, our little chip there 595 is working the way we expect it to all the logic's working the code works fine and that's in the segment.py so you can look in the show notes and find this code if you wanted to play with this yourself getting very close to the uh, the last number now we can see that we're getting to two four two four five so when it gets to two five 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 it should stop and all the leds should be lit up at that point so there we go and it's stopped uh, it looks weird on screen like there's an led that's lit up there but Oh, that isn't an LED. That's just the uh, the bottom of the board. But yeah, that stopped and um, and it's exited the program. So that's why it's uh, stopped there. So what I, the next step? Let's get, get back to the keynote presentation. Um, so next steps for me then. What I need to do is create a wiring harness for this uh, for this monster. <laughs> you can see I've started to do this now. I've got loads of these. Um, um, DuPont wires just because they're nice and easy to work with but I probably won't use them. Um, they're nice and easy to work because they plug in really firmly into the back of the package, the dip package, um, but I'll need a hell of a lot of them. Um, I'm going to need 12, um, 12 sets of these, so 40, well, 24 pairs of 8 wires uh, and then I'm going to have to connect all the common ones together. So all the segment A, segment Bs, every single one of these together, and then just have a shift register for the, whichever of the 12 um, digits it's on. So I don't need many pins for that to get um, to get that value. I think it's, um, did I work out? It's five pins, uh, so five bits. Again, using binary um, logic to store 24, if that's right 24 um, in there we don't need more than five bits so that should be fine again if we look on the, our little piece of logic there the next one the six pin will be able to store um, um, 32 values so five you can store up to 31 different values so that's more than enough for what we need so that means I just need to have five shift, sorry, one shift register just for those and one shift register for everything else. I should pretty much be able to get away with just two shift registers, which if you think about it is crazy, given that there's like 192 pins connected to this. So you can see there, um, go full screen just to show you a bit better there. So I've got the 3D printed sides on it. Um, these are just push fit in there just to hold it all into place. 
Um, it's not got a back on it just because uh, it doesn't need to have that and it's quite thin as a device. You can just about see there as well the bend. Um, it kind of looks like it's got a roundedness to it and that's just where I 3D printed it and it sort of slightly came away from the bed. But uh, that's fine. I've got some stickers as well that I've uh, created for the um, for the labels. So I've got now this is a bit you know this isn't movie accurate because on there they have a three digit display for the month they have like october and it's uh, one of those with the the extra uh, diagonal uh, sections in there but i've not gone for that so i've just got the month and day but apart from that it's fine and what i'm intending to do with this is make it into like a a youtube um view count and subscriber count as well as um just a regular clock um and i'll be able to sort of change it with the uh, mqtt um sending that values. I will have to figure out how to connect my Raspberry Pi Pico to um, internet, to um, Wi-Fi, probably using an ESP1. I've got loads of them um, knocking about and they are very, very cheap and very easy to get working and I've, I've done that on a few projects before. So that's one of the next steps is to create a wiring harness, join all the common pins together, add each digit to the shift register and I only need two of them and then one, I've said there are three actually, one shift register to set the individual segments, one for the 12 digits we only need five inputs for that and then one for all the other bits and pieces uh, for the decimal points and the AM and PM toggles and things like that. I'll probably be able to ac um, accommodate them in the other three bits that I've got available after using the other five so I've also got some other news for you as well. So this is all new for me. I'm going to start a membership program if you are interested. Um, so this is also to support the show, um, but also because this is seem to be in demand. So I've, I've thought about this and I've come up with three different levels um, of membership and we'll go through the, uh, the site in a second. So essentially bronze, silver and gold. Uh, bronze is um, as we have at the moment where if you want to support the show <clears throat> you go to buy me a coffee and you can um, buy me a coffee for five pounds uh, whatever that is five dollars um, and that helps just keep the show going uh, the next level up is the contributor so if you want to actually have like a weekly zoom call with me uh, and the other members we can talk about our projects we can um, support each other we can um, help each other get unstuck with our robotic projects that's the the next level up and that's going to be like 10 pounds a month so not very much more and then the accelerator program um, is if you're like really serious about robotics you want to get with some really smart people um, you want to take your robotics to the next level um, so you get everything that's going to be in the silver one and the the, the bronze level um, but you also get uh, access to a private uh, facebook group private dm access to me um, i get so many requests every single day from people personal messages saying can you help me with this can you help me with that and I can't respond to those people that's why I started the small robots group uh, on Facebook um, but this one is more direct access so what I'll do is I will um, I will load up um, on Chrome let me just load up in incognito mode I'll go to buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer which is my account but I'm just going to view this as if I'm a regular person not um not the back end of it because you don't need to see other people's details right so if i just bring this down here and i go back to oops not to that but to here to here in fact uh, let me just adjust the screen slightly so you can see what's going on okay so let's go to membership so the supporter level like i said that's five pounds a month um that just helps um, keep the show going you're going to be supporting the show and you'll also get access to exclusive posts and messages from me so the contributor which is the new one of um, launched today so you'll have access to a weekly zoom call with me um, we'll talk about projects we can support each other troubleshoot issues get unstuck that kind of thing um, so you'll get that support from me on a monthly basis you'll be able to unlock some exclusive posts uh, and messages as well from me um, you'll also get shout outs um, so at the end of the video I will do the uh, the credits that kind of thing um, also if I create any PDF downloads I'm currently charging um, um, I think four pounds for you'll get them for free included in that membership uh, any work in progress I'll be sharing with you as well behind the scenes and we've got this weekly call for collaborator members as well contributor members uh, and then the accelerator program. So this is if you're really serious about robotics, you want to sort of, you know, get with some people who really know what they're doing there. Um, 
you get the support from me. It's the same with the, the contributor access, but you'll also get some extras as well. So you'll get access to a private Facebook group that's only for those people who are in the Accelerator program. Uh, I'll do code reviews with you, whether it's in um, um, Arduino, C, C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python, anything like that. Um, private DM access, you can direct message me as well troubleshooting advice we can also look at like equipment you know what what a good lab setup looks like what kind of um, tooling is good uh, all that kind of stuff so that's 20 pounds a month so these things are ridiculously cheap i was thinking to myself i need to charge more for this um however i want as many people as, as possible to have access to these um a reasonable price so that's why i'm not making these ridiculous so to put this into context another accelerator program i'm a member of um, they charge about 1400 pounds per month for access to this and i'm saying 20 and this is because you're going to be founder access you're going to be the first people to have access to this um, so i'm kind of giving you an early entry um to have access to this so if you're interested in that um you can go for the bronze silver or or gold membership or what i'm calling the supporter contributor or accelerator program and if you want to learn more about that you can go to smarsfan.com and there will be um, as soon as i published it a membership um, button the shop will be disappearing and the membership will be there so i'm going to launch that um, in a couple of moments time just after i press the uh, the submit button on uh, github and you'll see that uh, appear there so you'll be able to read a bit more about that and there'll be links to it as well but you can go straight to um, buymeacoffee.com now so the um, the accelerator program i have limited that to 20 members so um, we need to keep that quite small just to make sure it works so those those places are limited uh, however the contributor and the supporter um, as many people that want to join that can do so that's um, my sales pitch over and I don't like doing sales pitch type stuff, but I do need some support on the show. I will not shy away from telling you about that. Um, so let's just go back to that. So, yes, that's uh, that's new today. Um, so the other thing is, obviously, I go live every Sunday, seven o'clock GMT ish. Uh, seven o'clock british summertime or seven o'clock gmt depending if it's winter or summer <laughs> and then at the various time zones i know i've not represented everyone's time zone on there but there are just too many to uh to do but basically america's and canada um european zone uh, pakistan india russia china australia and i think russia again and also the website if you've not checked out the website there is um plenty going on there like i said i'm gonna be launching this membership thing momentarily um, so on there currently there is the uh, the new learning platform that I launched a couple of weeks ago. So there's four courses on there currently. We've got the, um, the Smars How to Build a Smars Robot, the Quad How to Build a Smars Quad Robot, the Python 101, which is an introduction to Python uh, with some examples, and there is the Robotics 101. So if you're new to robotics and you want to get to know a bit more about that, there's a bit of background there uh, and a nice sort of gentle introduction. And I will be working on more of these, and this is why I created this membership program, because I want to get some really good feedback from people I trust as well. Um, so I listen to everyone's um, input, but there are people I listen to more than others, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so the people who've given back to me as well, um, obviously get more of my attention and uh, it's because they're, they're giving back that I'm listening to what their, their needs are. Um, so there is the regular buymeacoffee.com if you just want to go on there and uh, buy me a coffee and help support the show. Um, so that's the hosting website, the uh, royalty free music, the graphics software, the streaming software, the equipment when it works. Um, it seems to be caught up now. It's as if it needed to wake up. Who knows? <laughs> and as always, if you want to uh, help me out by liking, subscribing and hitting that little bell, that's also very appreciative. So hitting like on this video, if you're watching this on Facebook or whether you're watching on YouTube, that helps the algorithm re realize that this is good value and more people will get to see it as well. Um, if you hit the um, subscribe button, you'll know when I go live um, and that's twice a week currently. So Sundays and midweek, usually a Wednesday. And also, um, if you hit the bell button, you'll get that notification that I've gone live or I'm about to go live because it might not be at 6.30, it might be 7 o'clock. It depends. Midweek ones are all a bit... Depending what else is going on. <laughs> so hopefully that's been of value to you and you've learned a little bit about shift registers and a bit of binary stuff as well. Um, and you can build your own time machine if you want to... Uh, grab this as well i've designed this i've given it to you for free um there's nothing in return just that your enjoyment and uh, recognition of that so 
Um, thank you all for being with me. I'm just going to have a quick look at some of the comments um, just before I go, because I could see there's quite a few people talking. So let's have a quick scroll back up there. So we're talking about seven segment displays, a meter high one. I've got to check that out. Adam was saying there's an unofficial maker challenge to make the biggest display. <laughs> I think we need to make a two meter one. <laughs> And Andy was saying his first digital watch was the red lead. We, and you had to press a button on it, didn't you, as well? It's a bit like the uh, the old Apple watches where you had to sort of press the button to see the display. I've got the newer version that you can, that's got the always on display. Um, and uh, Adam was saying, yeah, the 16 pin dual inline package. So if it's got the, the two inline uh, pin things, then it's a dual inline package. Yes. And Michael was correcting me by saying the QA and QH are data outputs. Thank you for that. And Andy was saying, oh, um, all makes sense now. Good. I get a real good buzz when people say that because it means I've explained something <laughs> properly. Um, so do you mean um, the common ground to the Pico? And we talked about that. No, you don't need to have a common ground. Um, it works just fine. Um, if you have issues with grounding because you're using two different power supplies, you might just need to put some resistors in there. I did read that some people have put capacitors across to the ground if the LEDs were flickering a lot. Um, and that can be one of these sort of grounding issues as well. I, I've got a whole box full of um, capacitors, but it's one of those areas I need to sort of read upon, like which is the right value for that. Um, yes, and Adam was saying about another broken package from OSX. Yep, keep pushing out these broken packages. Yeah, I get the feeling working at Apple in the software development team is just hell. Um, and they, they, they move around. I think they have a small team. They don't offshore it, I believe. They do it all in uh, California. And... Um, yeah, they, they'll be working on like um, an iOS thing and then they'll switch to like, um, you know, one of the iWorks things like Keynote or something like that. And then they might switch to Final Cut. So that's why they why all the products are not always being updated at the same time. And when they have a big launch of things, it just must be hell for them. <laughs> um, they are too busy prepping the ARM series that they keep breaking Intel machines. <laughs> this is an ARM machine I'm on, actually. I'm on the uh, the M1. Um, so yeah, it works fine as well. Actually, it runs cold. It doesn't get hot as I touch it now. It's um, it's like room temperature. There's no fans or anything. If this was on my old Mac, uh, I've got another Mac. Um, it it wouldn't stand it at all. So is there a method called bit mask? Is the add method called a bit mask? Yes, you can you can call it that. Um, just um, a bit, a logical ending is is what a bit mask does in effect. Um, is it normal to have a common ground? Well, if you're having two power supplies, then um, you won't have a common ground. And like I said, it depends on... Ground can mean different things. You can have negative grounds, uh, and that could cause an issue. <laughs> so Einar says, hi, hi, Einar, how are you doing? All good? And Adam says, I'm on a uh, 2012 Intel. And the Intel chips, I, I found they were fine. Uh, I didn't think there was any issue with them. I think it was more about the fact Apple had to pay a royalty to Intel for every single chip. I mean, back in the day, do you remember the um, zero in insertion force um, sockets that you put the chip into? And then um, Intel realized they didn't get any royalty for that. So they invented this new sort of long... Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a sideways ZIF thing. You'd put it in like an edge connector and they could charge royalty and all that. And then nobody bought them. So they had to go back to the zero in insertion force ones. But um, yeah, I think Apple didn't like the way that the um, the heat was going on the Intel chips. They knew that they could do better. And it's always been on their long term plan to have their own chip manufacturing as well, because they can have more say over power management and um, more innovation in that in that area. So that's always been their wheelhouse. So yes, Ziff, Ziffs, <laughs> zero, insertion, zero insertion force. You did have to put a bit of force in there. Yeah, I remember if you um, if you like sprang the thing off, it would sort of fall out. Sill, is that what they were called? Something in line, something or other. <laughs> anyway, I had them for a while. They weren't great because they, they wobbled. So you had to have all these like, it, it, it just didn't work well. You've got like a, a motherboard that's flat and then you've got a CPU that's on the edge of it. So it's going to wobble. So you have to have like things to sort of hold it in place. It's best to have things nice and flat. Um, anyway, what do I know? I'm not a chip designer. <laughs> 
great. Okay, thank you for everybody watching. I um, hope this has been a useful one for you. It's been a fun one again for me doing it. And um, yeah, it was just midweek. I was like, I need to build that time machine thing that I've been waiting to build for some time and uh, get it working. I'm probably going to put this one to one side and then work on something else because other people have requested some other things, such as the, um, the Smiles remote control. So I've got the bits and pieces here. Um, it's kind of half built. I need to build a 3D enclosure. Um, and this is all soldered together as well onto a Pico. I've actually soldered something to a Pico. Um, but we can make some small thing. I, I've even found the designs I did for an original Smars handheld remote thing. Um, probably very similar to the ones James Bruton built. He has these beautiful um, remote controls for his robots. Nice and chunky sized. Uh, and he has like a display on it. So maybe we could pair it with one of the um, the displays. The, was it a 1306 display? SSD 1306 ones? Um, compare it with one of those and a little battery pack as well. So Carla says thanks, fantastic, thank you for that as well, it means a lot to me. Without further ado then I'll let you get on with your day and I shall see you for the midweek video um, on Wednesday. Great, thanks everybody, speak to you soon, bye bye.